Good afternoon, everyone. It's Lisa Norell. It is Friday, June 26, 2020, and welcome to my first live stream. It's my first live stream. I'm with you here on LinkedIn and Facebook, and I am thrilled for the next half an hour. I'm going to be able to give you some insights from the field to help you adapt to some of the new realities of marketing. And I mean marketing with a capital M, everything that has to do with interacting with stakeholders, customers, teams, and future customers. We're gonna talk about that entire universe of individuals who rely on you to deliver great value and to change, help them change the world. So for the next 30 minutes, I'm gonna invite you to post your questions in the chat box. Again, we're live streaming this from Facebook and LinkedIn. So I'm gonna start with a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, the first one being that this will be about a 30 minute discussion today. And also the chat box is really important because I'd love to know where you're from and what you're thinking. What questions do you have? I'll probably run out of time to answer all your questions. So we'll make sure that we craft conversations and insights and topics in the future that really address some of your biggest issues and pain points. So let me first begin by telling you a little about myself and then let's dive in. Um, I believe I've, I've had my business now 18 years and really what fuels me is the dream. It's the dream of being a great marketer. The dream of being a great marketer is alive and well. It's about improving your customers' lives, creating jobs, and really changing the world. And I believe being a great marketer is possible when you have the right tools, the right mindset, and the right community to serve. And so for the last 18 years, I've been very honored to work with brands such as Hilton, Google, AARP, and a host of others, and many mid-market companies who, are, who come to me because they're burnt out, they're overwhelmed, and they've just plumb run, run out of ideas on how they're going to innovate and grow. So my corporate clients on average will generate at least 3% to 30% top line revenue after working with me without damaging their values and or damaging their culture. So I have communities of chief marketing officers from across the United States and uh, some amazing clients. I'm very, very privileged to serve. Um, so you can learn more at lisanorell.com and downloads lots of free content. I've written two books. I'm on the Skillsoft e-learning platform. I have courses on LinkedIn learning. So there are many ways you can um, access some of the things I've learned and some of the pragmatic advice that I provide. Um, so enough about me. Let's talk about you. What am I seeing that may have an immediate impact on you as a leader? or as a person who in some way, shape or form works with customers or clients. I'm going to look first at eight of the major reasons that I believe marketing is under siege. And then the qualities that I believe that anyone, anyone facing customers, talking to customers or employees needs to embrace in order to adapt to these new realities. So again, post your questions as we go, because I want to know where you're from and what you're thinking. Um, so the first item I'm going to talk about is the shortage of empathy. We came, the pandemic put our strong economy to a screeching halt. We all know that. And one of the things, you know, my favorite aphorisms is that when the water is low, the rocks appear. You know, when the economy was doing really great, we could hide a lot of our mistakes. But now we can't hide our mistakes. You know, if we had sloppy marketing materials, our um, messages were 20 years old, or we were just clipping coupons and, you know, collecting a paycheck and the money or the customers were rolling in, you know, we could get complacent. So um, at that point, it's, not always easy to practice self-awareness, to slow down and to ask, 
what's working in my performance, what's not working in my performance, how can I improve? So, I mean, a perfect example of this is to look at organizations now that are really struggling or that no longer exist. Just, if, you know, you don't have to look far, look into the area of retail, um, automobile manufacturing and fitness centers. I mean, I was somewhat sad when LA Fitness's CEO decided for the for reasons of expediency that he would lay off a huge percentage of their people on a Zoom call. So again, this is a lens into what happens when you have to close your centers for four months and you have to take extreme measures and they were also carrying over $1 billion in debt. So, you know, when times were good and people could go to the gym, those types of egregious acts of uh, financial riskiness could be hidden because they constantly had a new stream of customers or, uh, you, know, you know, guests coming to the gyms. Uh, another example was Uber when they laid people off on Zoom. It really, really cut me to the core and it really hurt me to see that happen. So. There was a real shortage of empathy in so many of these examples. So I look at these and I ask you to, to look inside yourselves and say, where am I not showing empathy? Not only for my customers, but also for my employees. Your employees are your best brand ambassadors. So there was a real shortage of empathy. And one of the people who I turn to as an avatar in the department known as empathy in business is my friend, Martin Lindstrom. He's the author of seven books on branding, but he really understands that in lieu of branding, we have to start by looking at our cultures and how our cultures really shape our brand. It's a transformational effort for many of us. So if you want to uh, follow an avatar who really understands empathy, look no further than Martin Lindstrom. Um, Martin has he told me recently, he actually lived in the houses of 3000 different people while doing ex extensive market research and empathy research for clients such as Swiss Air, Lego and Burger King. So. He takes empathy very seriously and with his whole heart. Uh, so that's the first pattern I want to mention. Marketing is under siege because empathy was ignored for so many years. And now we're seeing how important it really is. So that was the first point I wanted to make. Um, the second point is around MarTech and programmatic advertising. Marketing technology and programmatic advertising now have severe limitations. So some of the things I'm going to say are contrarian, and I am sure that I will receive some um, frustrated comments, and that's okay, um, because I want you to think about this. How warm and fuzzy do you feel when you receive form letters and emails from your, your vendors? Not so warm and fuzzy, right? Neither do I. Account-based marketing, not so warm and fuzzy. An actual phone call from one of your business development representatives or one of your salespeople, not so bad, right? <coughs> so don't take my word for it. If you look up the McKinsey study, they found that 20% of the, this is a recent study that was conducted within the period of the pandemic. They found that both on the B2B side and the B2C side, 20% of the customers shifted their brands in the last three months. Wow. So what side of the fence are you on? The side of the fence where you're going to do what's expedient and quick and dirty? Or are you going to do what it takes to deepen your relationship with your customers? And instead of just sending an email newsletter, actually calling your customers setting up a Zoom call. You know what I did immediately, like the day after the pandemic was official? I reached out, to, I made appointments with 70 CEOs and chief marketing officers, and I called each of them. And I asked them just two questions. 
what are you struggling with the most right now? And how can I help? And boy, did that help them out. I mean, some needed help with their health, with, uh, you know, setting up their office differently so they could have privacy. Some of them needed some advice on mindfulness and meditation. And so I helped them any way I could. And some of them actually called me recently looking for some asking for how we could work together. So um, I do it just because it's the right thing to do. So don't over rely on uh, MarTech and programmatic advertising because companies like Eddie Bauer and um, uh, Ben and Jerry's ice cream just announced that they are freezing their advertising on Facebook uh, for political reasons. But as you can see, they're going to have to find other ways to deepen relationships with their loyal customers. I'm going to take a quick look here. We've gotten through two of the eight. Um, I got a question here in this. Thank you for your question in this economic downturn is back to basics, the path to resilience. What's fundamental for marketing excellence and what is not? Hey, Drew, thank you for joining. It's good to see you. Um, back to basics. You know, I have been in marketing and sales for 31 years. Um, and I'm not even sure what basics are anymore. All I look for is what does it take to be a good human and to create value? You know, how will I create the best value, the most value for my clients as I possibly can and reach as many people as I can in a way that's true for me? Um, you know, do I have the world's best studio? No. Does it help portray me as a person who likes simplicity and clarity and a kind of an understated approach? Yes, that was my, you know, that was my goal. So What's fundamental for marketing excellence is something I don't think is going to change that much. You know, one is knowing who you are. Number two, knowing where the greatest needs are. And number three, knowing what you're passionate about, where you can be rewarded very well for it. So those I think those are some fundamentals that never change. And thanks to the pandemic, we are being thrust into revisiting those questions. And by the way, not only about our business, but about our relationships and our personal lives. I've had two CEOs actually step away from their companies since the pandemic started because they said who I am now versus who I was when uh, pre-pandemic is different. So thanks, Drew. Appreciate that question. Number three, why is marketing under siege? Because this whole concept of authentic marketing is passe. It's not about authentic marketing. It's about marketing with agility. My best clients right now, and you know, one of my favorite, one of my, I know you're not supposed to have favorites, but I have an amazing client, um, Bazudo, here in the Washington, DC area. And boy, you know, they've been doing certain things very quickly and with great agility. Um, they launched a whole new uh, stay, in, stay at home with Bazudo program very, very quickly. Um, I had to shift my business model from our CMO peer groups, which would meet in person several times a year in different cities. Um, our live meetings shifted within three days to 100% virtual. Um, speaking with a fellow author recently, who just published their seventh book. Um, they have another book coming out. It's a typical two-year commercial book publishing cycle. He told me instead of waiting because, you know, warehouses are slowing down, deliveries are slowing down. He said, I'm going to write a pocket book. In six hours, he wrote a pocket book. It's 50 pages long. It's free. You can download it. He wrote it in six hours and got two. He received 1 million downloads. 1 million people provided their email address for that pocketbook since it was launched three weeks ago. So he said, you know, instead of a two year publishing cycle, we had a two week publishing cycle. Number four, stick to your swim lane. That is the old belief, right? Be a specialist, focus on one area and do it really well. As we've learned from the pandemic, 
it's not only about sticking to your swim lane, it's about expanding and creating unusual partnerships in order to thrive. I'll just give you a couple of examples. If you go to hashtag Bazudo stays home, Bazudo stays home, that's uh, the client I was telling you about, you'll notice that they have a panoply of courses, virtual happy hours, yoga instruction, and they partnered with the container store. Okay, think about this. A property management and real estate company partnering with the container store, a retailer, to help advise their residents on how to decorate their homes and make their work from home life a little bit better. Fantastic idea. You can also look at uh, footwear manufacturers like Adidas and Allbirds. They teamed up and they were passionate about reducing the carbon footprint. So what Adidas and Allbirds did is instead of competing with one another, they came together and they're producing footwear together. So, you know, you would think, why would competitors do that? They're doing it. And the third one I would look at that you really don't hear much about is how 30 CEOs came together in the pharma industry. 30 CEOs quietly, privately, and agreed, we will not sign non-disclosure agreements. We will, not, we will open the kimono of drug testing and drug development so we can team up and find some vaccines for COVID-19. So they have been meeting secretly for the past five months to come up with vaccines. And unlike the past where, you know, if we're lucky, we come up with two or three vaccines for SARS or um, AIDS. Now we have well over 100 drugs under development and some stage of testing. I don't know the current state of how many are under human trials, but look what happens when you look outside your swim lane and you look for unusual and interesting partnerships. It's, it's really fascinating. Okay, here's another one. Um, this comes from, yes, here's a great question. Do you find that marketing leaders are defining value differently, especially regarding financial returns from marketing activities? Oh my goodness, what a great question. You must have read some of my ideas today. I, I appreciate that very much. Um, and tell me where you're from, by the way. I'm really curious where these questions are coming from. Defining value, oftentimes the, in the past, you know, again, when the water was high and the water wasn't low, um, a lot of marketing leaders were able to get away from the need to report on metrics and ROI and try and, and experiment. Um, I did five years worth of research of CMOs and marketing innovation. So many of them would actually have innovation reserves so they could test things and see if there was a return on, uh, on investment. But now I think a couple of things are changing in the world of value. Hey, Jim and Little Rock, good to see you. Um, so what I'm seeing them do differently in terms of defining value is they are um, looking at changes in behavior. Um, what are the changes in our customer behaviors where we can have an influence? Um, I spoke with a friend today from the Marshall Goldsmith 100 Coaches community, and they actually built their own uh, live stream software products because they want to gauge the emotional sentiment of their customers when they're leading workshops. So think about that. You know, on Zoom, you can just click a button that says hand clap, I like it, or thumbs up, but they're gonna be able to capture human sentiment as they present new ideas, brand concepts, and so forth. I mean, how ingenious is that? Um, another thing that I'm seeing in terms of value being measured differently is um, we're going to have to be looking at more leading indicators as opposed to waiting for trailing indicators. So um, if I were to draw this, I'll give you a quick example. Um, when I look at success, I look at it as, um, you know, you've got leading indicators over here and you have trailing indicators over here. And so what you wanna do is um, you wanna be able to say, are there some internal or external, um, internal behaviors or external behaviors 
and that are going to drive the results that we need within the organization. So what I see happening, have seen happen in the past, is there's so much obsession over here with trailing indicators. You know, whether it's revenue, whether it's um, number of new, you know, number of new leads that we were able to convert over from, you know, whatever sales assisted leads into sales qualified lead, you know, whatever. There's so much obsession with that that they miss some of the early cues that the project or the initiative could be going off the rails and needs to be adjusted. So um, I'm seeing people now, thanks through to AI and again, back to empathy, they're able to be a, a bit more discerning to be able to experiment and then adjust more quickly. So yeah, Jim, thank you so much. Really appreciate that question. Um, number five, the days of being in a silo are coming to a close. This one I'm really excited about. Marketing used to run marketing, but now the lines are more blurred than ever. I'm finding that people are in charge of customer experience and they also have marketing under their belt. So there's, there's the merging of those functional areas. You know, ha I, I've talked to hundreds and hundreds of CMOs in the B2B space since I started my business. And, um, you know, where sales reports is all over the map. There are just as many different job titles and job descriptions for marketing as there are people. <laughs> so, you know, they're unlike a CFO role, um, the roles can be designed differently depending on the growth stage of the company and the culture of the company. So what I'm seeing now is that the silos are breaking down. My best CMOs who are best positioned for promotions, or to take on a role as a COO or a future CEO, they come to that role with expertise elsewhere. I can think about one of my CMOs here in Virginia started in product marketing and grew into the role of CMO and now is on track to be a general manager or CEO in her future. Um, I think of another CMO in New England uh, who's been a longstanding client has a background in math and is on track now to become president of that large company because they bring different backgrounds and therefore they're able to enrich the role of marketing in ways that a traditional creative person or brand person is unable to do. So that's what I'm another area that I'm excited about seeing unfold. Um, so marketing is no longer marketing's job. It's really an expanded role that is it's such an exciting time to be in marketing for that reason. Um, number six, this uh, systemic short term thinking about marketing ROI is going to have to die a slow death, period. So if you're a CEO watching this or a chief revenue officer who has the CMO reporting to you, I beg of you, please refrain from some of the pressures your private equity firms or your VCs are going to put on you to deliver this quarter, deliver this quarter. There are initiatives in marketing that take time. You don't cultivate customer relationships in three minutes or through, you know, pounding a, a customer with 17 emails. It's not how it works. Anybody else besides me tired of getting IT outsourcing random emails, you know, like once a week. And, um, you know, some of these robotic email campaigns um, to get short term leads in the funnel, I think are damaging. I know a CMO in South Carolina who I really respect. And she actually convinced the CEO to suspend sales quotas for a period of time during the pandemic and to only measure the quality of the, the phone conversations they had with prospects and customers because they realized their customers were not in buying mode. They were in grieving mode. They needed empathy and an ear to help them leverage what they, what they bought and to feel better about the road ahead. So kudos to that software company. So, you know, one thing is clear. 
And this, this is direct from the symposium that Adweek recently ran for CMOs. They learned that um, this is a collective belief that um, brands now have to play the long game in order to win. Do you have to manage short-term triage and problems? Absolutely. But you've got to have an eye towards the long-term as well. And number seven, brands are taking a stand. Out of the many, many dozens of CMOs I've talked to, only one of them is currently faced with a challenge around this. Every CEO is courageously stepping forward and saying, we've got to take a stand on what's going on with racism and uh, with the pandemic and you know, a, all the human rights violations and police brutality that we're dealing with. Um, Facebook is now losing tons of ad revenue because Ben and Jerry's and Eddie Bauer, and I believe today Verizon also backed out of their uh, Facebook ads for that reason. So if you're still sitting back going, I don't want to offend anybody. I'm not going to take a stand. We want, we don't want to upset any of our customers. You will be left behind. And don't expect any great employees to jump up and down to join your company when the pandemic is over because you didn't take a stand. Hence, you know, silence is considered a form of uh, resistance to this. Number eight, you know, number eight. I, this one really kind of got me. Um, I've been told all my life in my career of selling software, marketing, very large consulting engagements. I was always expecting that it was all about the product. It was all about the product. If you have a great product, you can build your marketing and your selling and your positioning accordingly, right? You, you will succeed. If you stick to your systems, you stick to your message. What I'm finding now, it's not about the product first, it's about our mindsets. I have been coaching my clients uh, for the last three months all around their mindsets. Periodically, they'll ask me a question about their marketing message or they'll ask me a question about hiring and retention. But the main thing they're concerned about right now is how do I keep my head in the game? How do I stay healthy? How do I put on my oxygen mask first so I can show up wholeheartedly and in a healthy way for my people, my loved ones, my, my spouse, my partner. So right now it's about mindset. How can you improve your own mindset and model those behaviors for the people you care about? Um, I recently was coaching a, a CMO who ran marketing for a multi-billion dollar technology company. And uh, they, they came to me because they were in career transition. And um, they have written a book. They have published on LinkedIn and other um, marketing publications. They, you know, they're very well known in the field. And while I was coaching them, I said, you know, keep writing, keep publishing, because you, you've got a lot to say. And they said, no, yeah, I've been taking a few months off from writing. I said, why is that? They said, well, you know, I've been on LinkedIn and boy, oh boy, LinkedIn, that is one crowded place. You know, 600 million people are on there and there's just too much noise. No one's going to listen to me. I sat back for a minute and I got quiet and I said, how dare you? And she said, what do you mean? How dare me? I said, how dare you hold back? your wisdom and your value. The world needs to hear what took you 27 years to learn. You are one of the top CMOs in the world. I said, you have got to get those articles written. So after, you know, she paused for dignity. She said, you know what? You're right. Within two days, that article was posted. Within three weeks, she received a great new position and is doing really well. So, you know, the mindset of, oh, I need to hold back. My article isn't, my, my ideas aren't perfect. My graph isn't right. I need new software or worse of all, I need a PhD to deliver this value. You know, if any of those mindsets are getting in your way, no one will care about your product because they'll never hear about it. And so, you know, this is an important time to really double down on your mindset who are the people that surround you? Who are the peers that help you? This is a great time to be asking those questions. How can you reframe and redesign not only your studio of life, 
but your studio of peers and cohorts. That's part of the reason I love my work because my community is, I'll just say amazing. So those are the insights that I have for you today. Uh, I'm gonna give you the headlines real quick and remember, you'll be getting a recording of this. If you follow me on LinkedIn, you'll, you'll receive all of these. Um, but I'm gonna read them very quickly for you and then uh, tell you what's coming up next Friday at 1.30. So again, those eight major reasons marketing is under siege, the shortage of empathy, the limitations of MarTech and programmatic advertising, the um, inability to market with agility versus authenticity, um, the unwillingness to leave your swim lane and think creatively and through partnering. Uh, number five is um, operating in a silo when it's in fact marketing includes a lot of other jobs now. Um, systemic short-term thinking to satisfy shareholders. Um, number seven, not taking a political stand and stepping back and being silent. And number eight, not uh, thinking it's all about your product when it all actually starts with your mindset. So those are my thoughts for today. My first live cast, you know, before I leave, I'm running one minute over because I would love to hear from you in the chat box. Oh, hey, Megan, John, thanks for joining. Um, I see we have people here from the UK, and from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, before you leave, put in the chat box, what would you like to hear next time? What, what's on your mind as a person interacting with customers and wanting to grow your business or enrich your life during these tough times? What do you wanna hear about next? I'm going to make sure we weave that into our future sessions. We're going to be broadcasting live every Friday, first three Fridays of the month. So make sure you join me here on LinkedIn or Facebook. And um, remember, we're going to be posting here, sharing recordings. But don't just walk away and say, oh, those were eight interesting things. Take it away and, and ask yourself two things for the weekend. Number one, where of those eight is your organization most vulnerable right now? And number two, what is one action you can take to address that vulnerability? So with those inquiries, um, if, you, if you're curious, you wanna share your results, drop me an email to lisa at lisanorell.com. Post your questions here. And boy, I really hope I get to see you next week and we continue this conversation because mindful marketing is a really important topic right now. And thanks to the world around us, marketing definitely will never be the same. There is no new normal. We are on the cusp of a new reality. So join me in designing that new reality. And uh, please have a happy and a very safe weekend. Take care.